Hi, I'm Angeline. I'm at Grimes Point near Fallon, Nevada to look at some of the oldest petroglyphs in North America and at one of the largest inland seas in the world, ancient Lake Lahontan. And the people who lived and prayed here for about 10,000 years. Whenever I drive through a desert like this, I just can't get away from the knowing that I'm driving underwater. I'm driving in the bottom of an ocean, of a sea, or at the bottom of a lake. This is what the bottom of a lake looks like when it's full of water. This is ancient Lake Lahontan, biggest, one of the biggest lakes in the entire world. And it's, it was an inland sea in the Pleistocene era, which was before about 12,000 years ago. When the weather changed, it started to, uh, started to get warmer. So the, the, the amount of rainfall actually has stayed the same here at Lake Lahontan for, I don't know, you know, through the Pleistocene, all through the Holocene, which we're in now. But the difference is that the climate has warmed. So the heat has caused evaporation. And of course, then human, modern humans, um, came and tapped all the springs and dammed all the rivers. And so the water flow isn't correct or as it would be naturally. So that causes this kind of drought, the combination of diverting water and also just the warming of the climate, evaporating the little bit of water that's always flowed here actually in the same quantity. There's the, the rainfall is thought to be actually the same between the late Pleistocene and the Holocene, which we're in now. The difference is the heat. You can see over there, see how smooth it is up to about there? And then you get that rocky top. That is the line, that's the shoreline right there, that, that where it's kind of green and then turns to dark brown. That's the actual former shoreline. And where we're standing now was 700 feet underwater. Megafauna would have lived out here and the paleo Indian people would have hunted here, would have hunted and fished and lived near the shores of this enormous lake. These are what's called pit and groove style petroglyph. And this is the oldest known kind of petroglyph anywhere in the world. Here they date to the late Pleistocene era, um, sometime between 14,000 years ago and 9,000 years ago. And you can tell pit and groove because of the size of the lines, how wide they are. Look at the size, can you see this? The size of this line compared to my hands, it's like the width of two of my fingers. That's, that's unusual in petroglyphs. Usually the lines are much closer together. And the pits, that's the oldest kind of petroglyph found in the world. Uh, there's a lot of um, ongoing t discussion about why the pits. Some people say it's because it creates a sound. It's a it's a rhythmic sound that people would hear, and it's a it's a call to ceremony or to worship. Um, some people would look at this and say it's used for grinding substances, but that's a whole other topic. I, that. That's not really the um, currently adopted thought about why a cluster of these would be together like this at this age. Um, also, I mean, look at the surfaces. It's not proper. I mean, it doesn't make sense for these, for this amount of them to be clustered together and um, on surfaces that aren't horizontal. I mean, your stuff would fall, right? <laughs> but that is one explanation that um, ceremonial pigments would be ground in these cupules or medicinal plants for ceremony. But also it, it could just be a cupule. For example, in Mexico, um, amongst the Huichol, they had these leather or wooden mats that they place over a cupule like this. The mat has a hole in the middle and the mat is painted with a symbol that they want to uh, call upon or pray to. And this center point is actually the eye of God. It's the point at which the God transports from the other realms into our earthly realm. And it can recognize it 
itself by the images that you place around this piece and then the center is held open so that the rock is exposed and then you place offerings in there. You place food, medicinal plants, tobacco, blood, corn, and that's the offering and that is the portal through which the human meets the divine. Now in, in the case of this area, this is volcanic rock. So driving a portal through volcanic rock would be very likely um, a means by which to commune with volcanic power within the earth that has brought itself to the surface and um, left it itself here at this power place. And so current thinking on this and um, consultation with native sources say that places like this would not be a habitation site, this would be a power place, a stop on a pilgrimage trail, or even just a place to pray, a place to, it's a place to um, commune with power, uh, to, to balance the earth. In more recent millennia, the Paiute Shoshone groupings of people would have been here, and they are probably the ones who made these anthropomorphic figures that are smaller, that are shallower than those pit and groove ones we saw before. When I see this, it makes me wonder if there's a spring nearby, but it is looking out at the lake and Paiute Shoshone informants have called these kind of anthropomorphic figures that are carved at power places water babies and water babies are powerful water spirits that live in springs but maybe in this case they live in the lake or the springs that feed the lake or maybe there's a spring right here nearby that i can't see yet or that has dried up that these uh water babies talk about. If in fact that's what they are. <laughs> the old way of thinking would have us believe that this is a place where um, people would have hidden behind the rocks and in order to shoot their prey um, because the shoreline would have been near, animals would come to drink, and then you could hunt here and that this was hunting magic. That's starting to become an outdated mode of attribution to images in places like these because archeologists have started consulting <laughs> the natives <laughs> and asking what they know about it. And they're saying that this, something like this wouldn't likely be some place where something as mundane as hunting happened in conjunction with imagery because imagery is ceremonial and sacred. That means this place is ceremonial and sacred. Hunting is practical. Different ceremonies and different different prayer, and it's sacred in its own way. Different prayer would happen for hunting and different practices. I mean, I've, I've had a Zuni explain to me that when hunting a deer, they would, after they, after killing the deer, you mean, aside from as much other ceremony and preparation and cleansing and purification you do just to hunt the deer, then there's the gratitude ceremonies for the deer giving its life for us. And then part of that gratitude is taking a, a bit of cornmeal and tracing it down the line of the body of the deer um, along its heart line, along its breath line. And I'm, I don't know, he, he didn't share with me what that symbolizes, but I mean, you can kind of maybe extrapolate the flavor of what that is in putting the sacred corn, you know, along the path where that deer would eat it, you know, spiritually, possibly um, eating it in the, in the spirit world, you're giving it its nourishment um, through that action and that prayer. But aside, anyway, you, everything has its spiritual practice, but hunting itself would not be combined with images like this um, at a place like this. It, it doesn't make sense. However, turn this around. Archaeologists do say that up on that these these uh, ridges here, there are some uh, like rock fences where people would drive animals to the edge, 
and then they have to stop there and then you can hunt from there. Yes, quite possibly that did happen. I'm not here to say if it did or it didn't, but that's that's kind of separate and apart from volcanic rock and images placed on them. So as I said before, there were different waves of people that lived here over time. In the late Pleistocene era, the people who lived here would have been um, the Paleo Indians. And then since then, a different group of people have come, the Paiute Shoshone people. And by the way, those names, Paiute Shoshone, I mean, they're related in that they're Numic speakers, they're Numic language speakers. Um, but when, West, when uh, Europeans came to this area, they named pretty much everybody that was in the Paiute region, Paiute. <laughs> <laughs> even though they didn't call themselves Paiute. So there were different bands of people who called themselves different things. And then the broad sweep of the Great Basin, the Western Great Basin just became Paiute. And then I can't speak to Shoshone. I actually don't know where that word comes from, but um, the Paiute Shoshone have ancient roots. Anyway, but they didn't come from here. They came into this area later, uh, I think within the last 4,000 years. And the Paiute Shoshone, made these images and we know that because i'm sorry if that's windy i'm trying to keep protect you from the wind um and we know that because these are the, not the these are not the paleo indian carvings these are not the deep pit and groove style these are the shallower ones so these were carved within the last conservatively four thousand years could be older but this image in particular is exciting because we know what it is we've been told from native sources this is Ocean Woman's Net. This is called Ocean Woman's Net. And Ocean Woman is the primordial force that um, came from, from this land of water, this, this planet of water, and brought land and stretched her body over the land until Coyote and Wolf said it was big enough. <laughs> Coyote and Wolf are also primordial. Um, we can call them creator twins. In fact, in, in yeah, it, in most creation stories worldwide, especially in the Americas, um, there is kind of a an original primordial source, in this case, Ocean Woman, or it, it could be, sometimes it's, actually I think Sun came along later. I'm not sure, but anyway, there's an original primordial source that gives birth to creator twins, the duality. We live on planet duality. Something either is or it isn't. We either like it or we don't like it. You know, <laughs> this is planet duality. And the creator twins twins represent that duality. And in as such, the wolf is the perfect being, the one that, that gets it right. Coyote is the, the fallible one, the one that kind of represents our human, you know, shortcomings and he he always plays them out in a way that we can learn from them um whereas wolf is maybe could be considered our our higher nature our better nature the good angel and the bad angel on our shoulders right anyway back to ocean women so this is her net and um yep that's what it represents so she, this is this is representing creation this is a creation image not a hunting image it's creation this is a si sacred ceremonial space when you see that the Paiute Shoshone say this is only ever placed at a ceremonial location you see it everywhere you see it a lot which means that anytime you see this you know you're at a sacred spot it's not a place somebody lived it's not a place somebody hunted it's a place where somebody practiced a ceremony probably on the way to an even more sacred place on a pilgrimage trail Water, 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 and possibly a water baby. You know what I'm finding super interesting about this place is, see how close I am to the hillside now where I was further down before? The higher up I go, the newer the petroglyphs, the really deep old ones are 
down there at the edge of this little mesa which makes me think there's edge of a little hill which kind of makes i don't know that's interesting i wonder if down there where the really really old ones are those were placed there at a time when lake lahontan was at an ebb it got low it raised and lowered over time um the last time well the last time it was at full capacity would have been about ten thousand years ago but it did raise and lower because for example out at the um lake pyramid petroglyphs were con which are considered the oldest petroglyphs in america they're under the water line which means that they would have been placed there before or during during a low ebb of lake lahontan and then the water filled up and left a layer over them which has since been exposed again and could be tested for date wow look at these so these are not the paleo indian um the really really old petroglyphs the pit and groove style these are the newer style but on the really old side so like early archaic where um they're the shallower type but one of the first ones right they're they're almost totally repatinated back to the color of the rock there was also some burials found here that um, um one of them was a 10 year old boy who had with him some fiber matting that has been able to be radiocarbon dated to i think about 9500 years ago there was also the burial of an older person there i'm going to i'm going to hop on out of here because i want to get over to just another nearby place called Hidden Cave um, because I'm on a bit of a time crunch today. I have to go excavate my teenager from a hotel room before we have to check out. <laughs> I couldn't, sleeping sounded much more appealing to him than coming out and um, exploring archaeology. I mean, I guess I would have felt like that as a teenager, but whatever. I'm having much more fun that he's not here to bring me down. So I got to go and I'm going to go over to the Hidden Cave, leaving Grimes Point. So I'm walking up this little hill here behind me up to a series of three caves. Um, they're along this little inner part. Now we know that the caves were formed here on the hills behind when the sea level was way up there and the water lapping, the waves lapping into the hillside carved out these caves. Then as the water lowered, people that were here at later time when the water w was lower could have used these caves for a variety of things. Continue walking, <laughs> walk and talk. Um, one of those things archeologists say is for storage of valuable items. I'm gonna challenge that a little bit because we know just around the corner, just over there, just right around that corner was a very high ceremonial site. We know that because the native informants have told us that volcanic rock is sacred and ocean woman's net petroglyph only appears at ceremonial sites and we know that several places are visited on a pilgrimage trail different kinds of places that serve different kinds of purposes one of those purposes would be or one of those places would be a cave where you leave offerings Offerings like bits of food, bits of sacred plant, what's this? Bits of, I'm um, sorry, a carved arrow points or uh, spear shafts or spearheads. I do wonder if, in fact, the cave that they found all of these artifacts in, in a variety of layers of, um, decomposition of that cave if those are actually offerings that were left on a pilgrimage this cave is what people today are calling picnic cave and what's nice about this is you can see how the cave was formed out Lake Lahontan out that way 
and then the water was all the way up here, if you can believe it. I mean, look at this. Look at, I'm a little bit high up. See, the water was way up here. And it was such a huge lake that it actually had waves, like ocean waves. And those waves would lap against these hillsides and, uh, you know, carve out caves. And this here is tufa. That's the layer of sediment that's left, um, Oh shoot, from alkaline, alkaline layer. I don't, I don't know enough about geology to explain what that is, but basically that's what's left when a sea level, um, you know, the, 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 a sea like this hits the rocks over and over again as it sort of recedes, you know, millimeter by millimeter, leaving this cr crested layer behind. I really can't believe how high the shoreline was. See this up here, this peak right up there? That's all tufa. So I'm way, way, way underwater. And I'm still not at the top. That's the, the, the sea floor, the lake floor. And I'm still not even at the shore yet. Incredible how huge this was. It extended a, uh, over a great portion of the Great Basin, this huge, huge lake. So my friend, I'm gonna talk out of my ass just a wee little bit, just for a second, just to illustrate a point. But I don't know if you can see behind me, back there is off to the side a little bit, sorry about the wind, is George Ridge in, in the Bunajug? Bunjug Mountains. I don't know how to pronounce that exactly. And it's a snowy mountain peak. It's the only one I can see around me right now. It's at about 8,000 feet. And from this spot where all the caves are, right over there, just bloop, right over there, are those um, ceremonial rocks that we looked out at at, um, at the Grimes Point. And right in front of me, right here, that's where these other caves are, um, possibly that were used for other purposes while ceremonies were being held over there because you wouldn't live in your ceremony space you don't live at church right so possibly these were this was the space used the caves here were used for something different but related because here you have an unobstructed view of a power place now i'm not saying for sure that this was a pilgrimage route to that power place but I do know that along a, a ceremonial trail, a pilgrimage trail, you have these different stops. And one of the stops would be for, you know, some kind of ceremony having to do with, for example, those volcanic rocks. And that would happen at a place where you have an unobstructed view of the power place that you're ultimately going to on your pilgrimage. So it is possible that that's what's going on here because I can clearly see that. The snow on top of that mountain indicates that it's a power place because it's a place where the power, the water power gathers. All the water is attracted to that point where it um, gathers and settles on that mountain peak and the water melts off that mountain, fills up our water sources so that we can use it. Behind me is what's now called Hidden Cave. Poor little Hidden Cave has been excavated three times and is now all sealed up. You can go in, um, I think the, the BLM offers tours to go in this cave on certain days of the month. So if you wanna go and see what's in there, you can actually see artifacts that are still in the various layers of the earth and also some tools left by the excavators and that kind of thing. There were five burials found in this cave, lots and lots of artifacts, cached food, um, and let's see oh there was even a latrine that was found in there a human latrine so we could see what people were eating thousands of years ago and they were eating local foods as well as pinion pine nuts which wouldn't be which aren't necessarily found here they, they would be found at a higher elevation um which means that they traveled to find food so they tra <laughs> gathering happened at great distance from these shorelines. Some of the artifacts in this cave were from the basket maker two and three periods, which means um, these were closer to around what we call the year zero. It's a pretty recent, just a couple thousand years ago, use of this cave. And how the cave was found 
was guano miners. A lot of the really interesting caves that have um, born a lot of information about this area and, and a lot of artifacts were found by guano miners. Guano is bat poop. <laughs> and these artifacts are like buried in bat, bat poop. So as they were scooping out the bat poop, they find the, they found the artifacts. Lovelock Cave, for example, is a really famous one, but lots of them around here are like that. And if you've ever spent much time in these kinds of caves exploring the Southwest, you know they're full of rodents. They're full of bats. They're full of um, pack rats. There's poop everywhere and they're disgusting <laughs> and it's, if this is where bats are attracted um it's dis it would have been disgusting in there just i mean if, you, if there's enough bat poop in there that you can excavate it that's a lot of bat poop and people would come here to get the bat poop to use it and so since artifacts were found in there as recently as a couple thousand years ago what I'm wondering is, weren't there bats there t then too? And would people be living in a cave full of bats? And why would you do that if you knew how to make proper shelters, proper you know brush huts and things like that, where you could live out in the open, where it's clean, where there aren't a bunch of rodents? Would you be storing your food in a cave that's not made of bedrock, that has all these little nooks and crannies in it where rodents and bugs would be to get at your food. Um, I can understand burial, that makes sense. In fact, basket makers all over the Southwest have been known to bury their deceased family members in the house, under their house. People who lived in pit houses, for example, there, there are burial cysts underneath those pit houses. Um, and in fact, those pit houses became what are the kivas, uh, because it's you know you're going deep into your 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 it's your hmm, I, I really am getting in the weeds with this, but it's your it's your sacred space when you're when you're in your kiva your 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 roundhouse kiva it is you know the it's it's a nod to where the ancestors were and the ancestors are in fact because they're under the. <laughs> They're under the pit house. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. We'll talk about that some other time. In fact, I did talk about that in, oh, in my video, uh, Atsana, Atsana. That's it, at El Moro in, in uh, New Mexico. So go to my video called Atsana. I give a whole description about that story and show a bunch of kivas and that kind of thing. Okay, so back to Hidden Cave. So um, people buried here, Basket Maker 2 period makes total sense. Basket maker two and three. Living in them doesn't make sense to me. Possibly staying for a short period of time does make sense. Possibly if you're here on a on a sacred um, pilgrimage. I do wonder if in fact the cave that they found all of these artifacts in, in a variety of layers of um, decomposition of that cave, if those are actually offerings that were left on a pilgrimage. Um, I'm not the ultimate expert, I'm just sharing what I know and from a logical perspective. So now we have some people coming up to use this, so I'm going to cut it off here and move on. And whoa, this is the most spectacular cave in this little complex of three caves right next to each other. <coughs> Look at that cathedral, like tufa. That's nuts. Let's see what's back here. Wow, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Look at that. It's like a little, there's some fire stains up there in the corner. Whew, there's fire stains up there too. I don't know if those are prehistoric because People probably have come up here, you know, in historic times and camp and stuff. Look at that. More fire stain. This is why this is called Burnt Cave, I guess. So many fire stains. Wow. In fact, oh my God. I mean, talk about a prime candidate for ceremony, song, praying, meditating. Let's see what we can see from the cave the whole lake and then that huge mountain that is 
my camera does, likes to flatten everything out. That huge mountain that's right there behind the clouds that you see right up in there. I don't know what mountain that is. I don't know what point that is. But I'll show you something else really cool that I noticed on my way up to this cave. First of all, right outside the cave. is something else. Hold on, before I even do that, let's see if we can really get a good look at this. Oh, jeez. Holy. That is just as ancient as can be. These caves were formed 21,000 years ago. At least. Whew. All right. So as we're going down from the cave, what I thought was really interesting is that little formation We'll approach it. So, you know, talk about a really great landmark. It's so interesting, right? It's really different than anything else I've seen since I've been out here, this beautiful little point. I wonder what it looks like. I wonder what its name is. I'm sure it has one. And from the landmark, you see straight out over Lake Lahontan, now dry Lake Lahontan, over to, um, Red Mountain, which is that way. Um, I feel like the clouds have covered it up. But there's a snowy peak over there. Another power place, of course, because it's tall and it has snow on it. And I mean, even in this dry climate, even in a warmer um, time of year, there's snow up there. Um, and it's only about 18 miles away from here. I mean, that's as the crow flies with the twists and turns and things. I mean, if you want to get there, two days walking, easy. So that's pretty interesting. The one we saw earlier, uh, George Peak, was only six miles away as the crow flies. Easy, I mean, definitely a candidate for um, pilgrimage path destination. That is not incredible. Well, this is where we leave off on our expl exploration of Grimes Point and the Hidden Cave Complex. Um, it shows that there were at least two waves of very different people who lived here. One group of people who were uh, Paleo-Indian, late Pleistocene, and another group that was... Um, archaic and people certainly of the basket maker two and three periods who left their artifacts in hidden cave we've seen what has been um verified by tribal informants as ceremonial place and even the definition of some of their symbols but you can see that from the the Paleo-Indian period to the Archaic period. The, they, were, they were different people and they thought in different ways and they had different kinds of symbols. I, for one, am on a quest to figure out who were those first people and know more about them. And that's the game we're playing here at the Ancient Southwest. <laughs> so I hope you're having fun with it. Please give me some comments. What do you think about any of this? Have you been here before? What did you see? What were your impressions? And um, maybe some things you'd like to see or know more about in the future. And I'll see if I can bring it to you. Going over the Facebook page, Ancient Southwest, where you can see uh, and post videos and photos of your journeys or other people's journeys and go to the ancientsouthwest.com where there's more content, writings, photos, videos, all the things you want. Easily searchable for other videos you want to see. Thanks so much for watching. May the fire inside you continue to burn brightly.